Excellency Ambassador of Ili Ambassador Rautel Rautek. It's difficult to pronounce your first name, so I'll just <laughs> yes. And um, Governor Edna Sutter, past District Governor Billy Villarreal, and um, Mrs. Videla, yes, then Emily Alvarez, a dear friend, a leader now, the head of the Congressional Spouses, who will be implementing many of the laws that we have authored including and most especially climate change adaptation, environmental awareness, tree planting, and indigenous people's culture. I'm putting it on record so that Emily will remember to implement it. And um, all the former presidents, officials, and all those present here today. Well, where do I start? When I speak about climate change, there's just so much to be said but perhaps because I prepared a PowerPoint so that it would be easier for you to understand, I'm certain that many of you have an idea, have read, have great interest. The reason why you asked me to be here today is because of your great interest on climate change. Uh, it's important that those in positions of leadership and influence and power, such as yourselves, Rotarians, Zontians, JCs, uh, all the organizations that could wield power and influence and actually operationalize all our laws, that you actually embrace it and uh, understand it and help us get it implemented. I would therefore encourage Rotarians to take a more active role in finding solutions to the growing social, economic, and development challenges caused by environmental degradation and natural hazards made stronger or made worse by climate change. Do you know that today, not many people know about it because the media don't write about these things, is the International Day for the Preservation of the Ozone Layer. Of course, people will say, hey, I need a front page, it's not in the news, they would rather talk about all the seemingly negative things. But today is International Day of the Ozone Layer. And it's a very good reason to celebrate because the ozone layer is beginning to heal. Scientists have confirmed that the hole, there was a hole in the ozone layer above Antarctica is beginning to close and according to recent research by the University of Leeds and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, the hole may close permanently by year 2050. So it's like having a wound and the earth is wounded because we're wrapped by the ozone layer because of the intense heat and the pollution there was a hole, a gaping hole. But because, and I'll tell you why, it's closing. This success is due to the unity of nations in adopting the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer and the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer but also turning commitments into action, particularly, maybe a little light here would do, by phasing out substances that are responsible for ozone depletion, such as chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs, you've heard about that, and hydrochlorofluorocarbons or HCFCs. We are not scientists, okay? I don't pretend to understand it completely, all I understand was because of the Vienna Convention and the Montreal Protocol and we signatories, India, the Philippines, many other nations, we abided, we translated policies, commitments into action. And the hole in the ozone layer has, it, is closing. So that's good news. It shows how the community of nations, when they put their heart into it, can do something good for the world, for humanity. So it's good news. And although I would want to dwell on this, 
there is another urgent concern we need to address now, and that's the climate crisis. Nations are scrambling to limit global warming to less than two degrees Celsius. A sea level rise threatens to submerge island nations. What is that community in Antarctica, which has declared itself as a community of climate refugees and are actually transferring because they will soon disappear. We know very well, perhaps Ambassador would know better, their neighbor Maldives of a million people have already since way back purchased land or contemplated at least on transferring the whole population. Is it to Sri Lanka or to India as well? India, yes because they are vul a vulnerable population because of sea level rise. We don't even have to look far. Our own country, because of many reasons, including sea level rise, we have floods even when there's just a few hours of rain. So we see that all of these contribute towards making our lives more difficult and dangerous, and we have become, to a certain extent, climate refugees. Second, ocean acidification is causing irreversible damage to our coral reefs. While the sudden shifts from hot temperatures to incessant rains pose uncertainties to agriculture, greatly affecting our food security. I see it as chairman of the Finance Committee. The others are good performing agencies and departments. It's always agriculture with negative, below zero accomplishment because of the natural hazards. If it's not El Nino, it's La Nina. So it affects our food security. And for a burgeoning population of more than 100 million, and if we don't adapt to the changing climate, it's going to be worse. The warming climate is now one of the most significant risks for even our World Heritage Sites. How many of you have gone to the Ifugao rice terraces? Extreme rainfall and heavy floods constantly threaten lives and livelihood and development. And our Ifugao rice terraces, which has been declared by UNESCO 15 years ago as a World Heritage Site, is in danger because of climate change. What has really caused this constant warming? of the Earth's temperature. Key findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, the group of scientists, more than 1,000 of them, who helped former Vice President Al Gore in the research on climate. They revealed that climate change is indeed unequivocal, and that there is 95% likelihood that human activity is a cause of global warming. Human activity released 545 gigatons. It's difficult to fathom gigatons of carbon dioxide, the main greenhouse gas from 1750 to 2011. And in the last decade, 90% of the rise in carbon dioxide levels was due to the burning of fossil fuels. And unless drastic cuts are introduced. Global temperatures are projected to increase by 0.3 to 4.8 degrees <coughs> Celsius by the end of the century. This explains why nations, especially those highly vulnerable to climate impacts, such as the Philippines, pushed for the inclusion of the phrase 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limit in the drafting of the Paris Agreement, which was inked on April 22 in New York, which the Philippines still has to ratify. I hope and I pray that our president will support the climate agreement because a country like the Philippines, as vulnerable as we are, have our conditionalities or our submissions as conditioned or pegged on technical and financial assistance which will be given to us by the industrialized countries. In short, we don't have to set back our development. We are all to gain because we will 
receive technical and financial assistance just like small island nations are going to, even if we are a non-emitter in the world. It was not an easy journey for the Paris Agreement, yet we continue to move forward through the challenging path of pushing for its ratification. I believe that 27 out of the 197 parties to the UN FCC have ratified the agreement, including the US and China, the two biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. They represent 39.08% of global greenhouse gas emissions. I'm tempted to ask Ambassador when India will ratify its own or who will come first between the Philippines and India. For the agreement to enter into force, at least 55 parties to the UNFCC representing 55% of global GHGs must ratify it. I am hopeful. In fact, I had an early morning breakfast today with a DCM of the US Embassy and some of our officials in the Executive Department in Renewable Energy and the Climate Change Commission so that USAID and uh, the US government can help us capacitate our local governments in coming up with their local action plans on climate and can give technical and financial assistance. I'm hopeful that our government will not take too long to realize the wisdom of completing the process of ratification. But even as the Paris Agreement has been hailed by many as a landmark agreement, its aspirations will not happen on its own. Bending the global warming curve to 1.5 degrees Celsius is a moral imperative. It means saving the lives and livelihoods of millions of people. It means upholding the human rights of the poor and the vulnerable. It means ensuring the integrity of our ecosystems. The Philippines has committed to a 70% greenhouse gas emissions reduction by 2030 from the business as usual scenario from energy, transport, waste, industry, and forestry. We also committed to the building of resilience of our communities and to promote inclusive growth in accordance with the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Sustainable Development Goals. What do all these buzzwords actually mean? All it says is that, yes, we will mitigate. Someone will ask, why do you need to mitigate? when we are only a 0.3% emitter in the world. But put the developing nations together, and that will still be a big chunk of GHG in the world. And all the more because we are vulnerable. We need to be capable of action to prove to the bigger countries and industrialized nations that we are doing our share, even if we are a non-emitter in the world. Delivering our commitments to these global frameworks is our way of telling and showing the world that though we are vulnerable to natural hazards and climate impacts, we are not incapable of action. We need to strengthen the capacity of our government and apply the whole of society approach in integrating responses to climate change within national to local policy frameworks and programs of action. The Philippines indeed has the best laws in the world. The National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Act, the Climate Change Act, the People's Survival Fund, Clean Air Act, Solid Waste Management Law, Clean Water Act, Environmental Education Awareness. I'm so privileged to have been instrumental in the passage of all these legislation since 1998. But these are just pieces of paper. If it's not implemented by our government agencies, by the private sector, by everyone. The greater challenge really is to be able to translate policies, plans and programs into local action with measurable gains. And so since I'm a policy maker and I'm the author of more than eight environmental laws and the chairman of finance, what I do is I mainstream 
operational details like putting water catchment in every deaf end school, like segregation of waste in every government facility, like the retrofitting of our bridges and public infrastructure, like the changing of our lights into LED. We put it in the General Appropriations Act so that each department and agency, it could be spelled out what is needed to be done. The government has been undertaking the process called climate change expenditure tagging, where government agencies identify, report, and track programs, activities, and projects that are responsive to climate change adaptation and mitigation. This is done during the budget preparation and once the National Expenditure Program and the General Appropriations Act are approved. Just so that you're familiar, the NEP is the first document with a 3.35 billion budget, trillion budget, given to Malacanang, goes to the lower house, and goes to the Senate. It comes out as a General Appropriations Act. It's the biggest and most important piece of legislation. And I'm proud to say that in 2016, more than 50 general and special provisions on environment, culture, and climate were integrated in our GAA with no opposition and no debate. I made congressional insertions, and my insertions were policies on climate. insertion So as chair of the Senate Committee on Finance, we were able to transform the 2016 national budget into one that is climate adaptive and disaster resilient. We have mainstream provisions that ensure that the implementation of government programs will contribute towards building resilience. And we will continue to do this in the 2017 budget. But promoting sustainable growth is not the duty of government alone. It is everyone's responsibility. It is important to put communities at the heart of relevant programs and policies and gather collective action that is rooted in a sense of solidarity and shared responsibility. The private sector is encouraged to promote green policies and put resilience at the core of their business strategies. Just as an example of an invest, a big investment bank that I think has an office, small office in the Philippines, but based um, in, in London and in New York, is Morgan Stanley. It started treading on the sustainable investments path. From being a traditional investment banking group, it created what it calls the Global Sustainable Finance Group just seven years ago in response to emerging markets and covering areas that supported sustainable living, but as diverse as clean energy, green bonds, or even affordable housing. What do I mean? It was explained to me that in Nigeria, for example, Morgan Stanley supported a can manufacturing business. Well, they used to import cans all the way from, I think, Ontario in Canada, and they now fill the contents of the cans, or they got local labor to actually produce the cans in Nigeria. You say, how can this be environmental at all? Well, it clearly reduces the carbon footprint of the importation and giving local labor to the production and manufacturing of those cans needed. Now that the company is able to manufacture its own cans, they produce less carbon emissions and create more quality jobs. Here in the Philippines, we should encourage investments in sophisticated, sustainable energy technologies, as these will reduce harmful emissions, protect health and the environment, and sustain economic growth. It is clear that we need to act now. We must decrease our dependence on fossil fuels when applicable especially coal, and shift to renewable energy. We were just discussing earlier what India is doing, which I'd like to learn more about, on carbon pricing and putting a tax on carbon without affecting our vulnerable populations, our consumers, and the public. In fact, the Department of Finance is going to put an excise tax on fossil fuel, and they said, why not a carbon tax, while reducing 
income tax or corporate income tax. So it would ease the burden on individuals and corporations, but be able to recoup whatever it will lose from taxation on coal. But this is something which is simply being studied yet. So I just feel that we must have a paradigm shift and um, veer away from our culture of waste, from our throwaway culture, and aim for a zero waste economy. We must turn our, our backs on our very extractive and consumptive practices. We can all do this together, but we have to embrace the concept of simple, sustainable, healthy, and resilient lifestyle. Just going back to the basic qualities of life. We start with ourselves because the only way to inspire others to action is to actually do it myself. For example, in my office, it's so simple. We just change all our lights to LED and we segregate our waste at source, recycle, and compost, which is the essence of Republic Act 9003, or the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law. We actually have four bins in our little kitchenette in the office, and that is for LATAC, residual waste, those which cannot be recycled. Second, for bote lata plastic, those that can be recycled and so. Third, uh, food waste, which can be used for organic compost. And fourth, for paper waste, which can be used uh, at the back to be recycled or made into bags. It's actually very simple. I do it in my own home. I do it in my little farm. I do it in my office in the Senate. Even the rainwater catchment, which is a 1989 law of the Rainwater Collection Act. How many of us actually have rainwater collectors in our home? I do, in my home in Makati, in my little home in, uh, in the outskirts, in Tegaytay, Emily has seen it. And this is actually a requirement that the BPWH should have been implementing since 1989, because with so much rain, it goes to waste. Why not collect it and use it to water our plants or use it to flush the toilets? Because our plants would even be, would even generate better growth or would even be healthier perhaps because it's rainwater that, that waters it and not chlorinated water from the tap. So, mumura ang tubig bill, your water bill will go lower. You can reuse the water from the rain and um, the plants will even be better. These are actually very, very simple, everyday uh, practices that we can do. Even the recycling of bottles and cans, we don't have to buy uh, plastic cases or expensive pots and we can actually grow our own herbs in our backyard even just on a balcony or a window sill. Just last Saturday, I attended a urban gardening workshop. There were young and old, there were retirees, there were uh, people who were working, and I just wanted to see how this young couple, a lawyer and her husband, an agriculturist, actually practice it in their home, in their garden. And they actually plant in their mid-sized garden and harvest, if I'm not mistaken, 50 kilos a week of vegetables. They hardly ever buy food in the grocery because they even have uh, uh, chickens, 70 chickens, and they eat their own eggs, and they even sell the eggs that they generate because it's not enough for the young family of four or five. So it really amazes me how some people can make do with limited space and limited resources. And if we actually do these things, segregate at source, recycle and compost, have rainwater collectors, do urban gardening, and do our own compost, um, shift to renewable energy, and implement energy efficiency. Close lights were not needed. Don't use aircon when not needed or put it at a certain temperature, 25, I think, or to a thermostat so it does not generate too much, or even pull the plug when you're leaving the room when not using it because it still it generates electricity. 
So these are little, little everyday habits that we can change. And I'm very OC about that. Ask them. I leave my bedroom. I take out the plug of the Wi-Fi, the electric fan plug and everything. Oh, I know it's a bit, it's a bit of an exercise to be bending and doing all of that. But I, I just have to convince myself before I can even speak before any group, I can do it myself. And so you're all welcome to visit my office to see what I mean. Even our tables are made out of recycled pallets. We don't have cubicles like any office. It's recycled pallets from my son's business because he's a solar entrepreneur. And what he would have thrown in a warehouse or thrown as waste, we developed into a seating of 14 or 20 for, for all the staff. We need laws to be passed. We need laws to governance. But the law itself cannot change people's behaviors and mindsets. Yes, the laws, we lawmakers, will set the policies that are meant to inspire leaders and community members give life to these policies. And that's the importance that we play in our society. Imagine if the is it five clubs, seven, present here today, we just replicate the things that I'm saying. Very, very simple things. Or just talk about it uh, in your next meeting. Uh, it, it would make a lot of a difference. Um, there are many things else that I could, we can actually do a booklet on the 10 things to do in your home, 10 things to do in your office, 10 things to do in your community, in your barangay, in your subdivision, even in your condominium, or even in whatever little home. Uh, as I said, in the farming workshop I attended, up to a 10 square meter of plot of land can be developed for an urban farm. Uh, even looking at our traffic, if we had walkways for pedestrians, if we had just a, a bike lane so that people can, can take bikes, I would love to just, if there were pedestrian lanes, I would rather walk if, of course, the air quality was better. So there's so much that we could do together. And what we need to do is have a change of the way of living from the business as usual, a change of mindset, the mindset of a throwaway culture and oh, so much wastage. Uh, I lived very differently many years ago uh, to the kind of life I live now. I'm a work in progress. My life is a work in progress, but it has changed dramatically because I see that there's so much waste in the world. And if each and every one of us would do our share, then I think that would create a dent in, in, in our life today. As a long time, as a how many decades long environmental ad advocate and a climate activist, I know how difficult it is to convince people to protect the environment. Perhaps not you, but other people whose priorities are different from ours. Because people only act when there is threat, when there is fear. But that is not how we should live. People need to be inspired and feel that they are part of a shared cause. 30 years ago, we were panicking over the ozone layer depletion. But the positive signs that the ozone layer is starting to heal prove that when nations unite and work together, we can fight even such a great challenge. This should inspire us now as we address the climate crisis. We live in only one planet. There is no planet B. And by now, climate change should make us realize that we are all connected and we suffer the same consequences of this climate crisis together. It's not the time for restraint. This is not the time to wag the finger of indictment. This is not the time for apathy or indifference. This is the moment for collective and urgent climate action. If we start today, there is no promise that we will be lucky enough to see the undoing of the damage within our lifetime. But at least we leave our world, we leave our children and our grandchildren the gift of hope of a better 
and kinder future. So on this occasion, I thank you for your tolerance and your patience by listening to me. And I hope that while policies have been enacted and speeches and messages have been delivered, we depart and go home with something that we can actually contribute in our families, in our communities. Even the mere segregation of waste and recycling and composting, even the sheer energy efficiency by taking off the plugs or changing our lights to LEDs, even by saving gasoline and walking, if possible, when applicable, instead of taking our vehicle. I should walk my dog um, myself. It's not very easy in a very cramped, polluted metropolis such as Metro Manila. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope that you can be my partner in making our society, our country, a better, kinder, healthier, safer, more resilient nation. Thank you.